When we served as CMS missionaries in Mexico, we would email monthly prayer points to CMS for use in various contexts. Once during our early months in Mexico, we included a request for people to pray that we would be faithful in our marriage. Now, it wasn't that either of us had been unfaithful or that we saw some imminent danger of infidelity. We were simply asking people to pray proactively with us that we would be faithful to each other as husband and wife. We were amused and mildly frustrated when we received the next month's CMS prayer bulletin and saw that our prayer request had been edited to read, Please pray that Charlie and Catherine may have more time together. At this early stage, we were boarding in one room of a Mexican family's home and doing almost all of life as a couple. We didn't need more time together. The thoughtful concern from the editor of the prayer bulletin was that a prayer for faithfulness in marriage might lead people to assume that we had marital problems. We should pray for faithful marriages, and it's good to pray for the marriages of Christian leaders. Some years ago, I heard a report about a minister in Geelong. He was at the local supermarket. When he got to the checkout, he began to introduce himself to the cashier, who replied, I know who you are. I belong to the local Satanist group. We're praying for your marriage to fail. It was the supermarket checkout, so I suppose she finished with, Have a nice day. Before becoming a local church pastor, I saw the marriages of three of my pastors fail because the pastors committed adultery. To members of All Saints, as your minister, I would be very grateful for your prayers for my marriage to be faithful and joyful and God-honouring. I'm happy to tell you that Catherine and I are about to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary, and we hope that the lockdown in Melbourne will end so we can do something special. They say the first 50 years of anything are the hardest, so on that reckoning we're about halfway up the hill. I value your prayers. Unlike our CMS prayer editor, God is not reticent in talking about the importance of sexual purity and faithfulness in marriage. So the seventh of the Ten Commandments decrees plainly with just two words in Hebrew, you shall not commit adultery. As we'll see in a few moments, the Seventh Commandment has a broad application in the Bible. But to be clear about the basic concept, adultery is when a married person has sex with someone other than their husband or wife. God says you are not to do that. Studies suggest that marital infidelity occurs in almost a quarter of marriages. God prohibits adultery, and he prohibits it for our good. Marital unfaithfulness does terrible harm. It can tear apart marriages, families and communities, including churches. Perhaps you have experienced the destructive power of adultery. In case you missed the sermon on the fifth commandment, honour your father and your mother, I want to repeat something. From the Bible's first pages onwards, including here in the Ten Commandments, the basic ideal of family presented in Scripture is a faithful husband and wife living in a home with their children who honour them. And that has been the basic unit of settled society for thousands of years. Incidentally, that's also why there is such emphasis in the Bible on caring for the widow and the orphan, those who have lost the love and support of a family unit. In a culture that increasingly challenges that traditional model, we need to hear these things clearly. 
for pastoral reasons, we also need to hear some other things clearly. The biblical model of marriage and family doesn't mean that single people aren't whole people, or that marriages without children are incomplete. It doesn't mean that children without a traditional family are doomed, or that single parents, grandparents, adoptive or foster parents can't do a wonderful job of raising children. And it certainly doesn't mean that things will always be rosy in traditional nuclear families. In upholding the biblical model of marriage and family, the seventh commandment forbids adultery. When we read a prohibition in the Bible, it's always helpful to ask what the positive goal of the command is. God's prohibitions don't only point us away from what is bad for us, they also point us toward what is good for us. In this case, toward what is good for us regarding sex. Our culture focuses on sex for pleasure, doesn't it? The Bible also celebrates sexual pleasure in the God-given context of faithful marriage between a man and a woman. Passages in Proverbs, Song of Songs and elsewhere in the Bible express sexual pleasure and passion in language that is both poetic and earthy. The Bible's view of sex is not prudish but precious and it holds passion and purity together. Procreation, of course, is part of the picture. That is, that marriage is the context for sex because marriage is the context for having and raising children. In Genesis 2, it's not good for the man to be alone because he won't be able to multiply and fill the earth and exercise dominion over it by himself. He will need help. And there's something else besides pleasure and procreation in the biblical view of sex. In God's design, sex establishes and expresses a profound union. It makes two people one. We read in Genesis 2, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. In 1 Corinthians 6, the Apostle Paul takes this theme of oneness a step further in urging sexual purity. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Do you see what Paul is saying? Believers have a spiritual union with Christ, such that any immoral sexual union is a kind of spiritual adultery. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says that the relationship between a husband and a wife is meant to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. Isn't that extraordinary? In 1 Corinthians 6, he goes on to say, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Do you treat sex as precious the way the Bible does? Do you treat sex like a rusty ute or a Rolls Royce? John Dixon writes, if you think of sex merely as a pleasurable physical experience, it probably makes sense to throw off any perceived shackles. So long as it's safe, it's fine. 
It is a bodily delight only, like eating an exquisite meal. But if you find yourself persuaded that sex is a joyous physical enactment of a profound spiritual truth about oneness with another human being, you will approach sexual activity very differently. As Paul's exhortations about sexual immorality indicate, that treating sex as precious gives the seventh commandment a broader application than just adultery. So we read in the letter to the Hebrews, marriage should be honoured by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. On the negative side, did you notice that honouring marriage and keeping the marriage bed pure means avoiding sexual immorality of every kind? The Bible's concept of sexual immorality encompasses adultery as well as sex before marriage, sex between men or between women, pedophilia, bestiality, and according to Jesus, lust of the heart, which includes pornography. In fact, pornography gets at the heart of what lust is. For those with tender consciences, it's not the feeling of arousal caused by looking at someone you find attractive. Rather, it's looking at someone other than your spouse with the intention of satisfying your sexual desires. About every kind of sexual immorality, God says, stay away from it. What can we say on the positive side about honouring marriage and keeping the marriage bed pure? For the married, it involves faithfulness, giving yourselves to and delighting sexually in each other, and participating in the wider community that is so vital for both the married and the single. For the unmarried, it involves being chaste in body and mind, encouraging the married couples around you, and cultivating godly friendships. For the church, it involves encouraging one another in these things. Research suggests that belonging to a religious community reduces the incidence of adultery. So one of the best things we can all do to honour marriage is to be committed to church. Let me finish with a word of advice and a word from Scripture to the tempted, the wayward, and the brokenhearted. First, a word of advice for you all. Sexual sin thrives in the dark, in secrecy and shame. So if you are struggling, come into the light. Tell a mature Christian or a Christian couple whom you trust and ask them to walk beside you in that fight. Second, a word from Scripture. To the tempted. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. As an aside, Paul's words here are very helpful if you are in a dating or courting relationship. It's tempting to ask, how far can we go with physical affection before we fall into sexual sin? It's better to ask, how can we honour marriage and keep the marriage bed pure? It's tempting to define your limits and go as close to them as you can. But it's a bit like blowing up a balloon. You'll only know you've reached the limit when the balloon bursts. And the more you blow the balloon up, the more likely the balloon is to burst. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. To the wayward, who are choosing to live in sexual sin. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. 
that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. To the brokenhearted who grieve over past sexual sin. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. In the Old Testament, God tells the prophet Hosea to marry a promiscuous woman, Goma. She is unfaithful to him, and God tells Hosea to go after her and bring her home. He says to Hosea, Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. It is a living parable of God's enduring faithfulness to his unfaithful people, and it is a beautiful reminder for those who have drifted away from God into any sin that there is always a way home if you will come.